authors, entertainers to innovators. We connect with those who help shape our culture. Join us in revealing stories of their lives and backgrounds, their triumphs and tragedies that molded them into who they are today. Authentically off script and personally illuminating, this is Audibles with Jason Scarborough. This week on Audibles, Chris Limonis. So your story starts January 22nd, 1970. You were born right here in Storville. Is that right? No, no, I was actually Biloxi. Keesler, Keesler Air Force Base. Your dad was a student here, though. My dad was a student here. And so your your story of Mississippi State goes far back, right? It does. We, uh, My mom was from Biloxi. My dad was from Gulfport. And then uh, he got in the Air Force. I'm a big Air Force family. And my uh, my dad went off to the Vietnam War and then came back, you know, and was in the service during the Vietnam War. And then, um, you know, I was a two-year-old here on campus living in married housing with my mom and dad. And so I grew up a bulldog my whole life. I was a fan from afar because we didn't, once my dad got out, we traveled all over the country. I've been, I've been everywhere, but, um, you know, we've always been a, you know, Thanksgiving was always a big deal because the Egg Bowl was on, you know, and for some people it was just one football game. Our family was a little different. And um, so it's a pretty neat story to be able to come back. You have any siblings uh, growing up? I did. I have a sister. She's in Las Cruces, New Mexico. So she's, um, you know, she's out there with her husband and family. And uh, but she'll get back here a good bit. And um, but it's, you know, it's a lot of family. I probably have a lot of family down on the coast and and down in that area. That's one reason we go down there and play so much. You know, we get down there and and play on the coast just because it's uh, it feels like home. So was your family an athletic family? Are you really the the first athlete? No, well, my dad won a state championship, I guess, or whatever they call it back then at Gulfport High back in the day. So he was a football player, but he didn't play baseball. So I played it all when I grew up. So I'm probably the only athlete besides my dad. But my dad was the reason I was in baseball and sports. And he was my little league coach and, and everything else. So he kind of coached me all the way up. So it's easy to see that's probably where your love for baseball comes from is being around your dad. Oh, yeah. I, I loved every sport, though, coming up. It was, you know, back in the day, you'd play baseball all summer, pack your bag up, and then we went to football, and then we went to basketball. And But my dad was involved in all of them, so I think that was the biggest piece. And my dad probably didn't have a dad around a lot when he was younger, so I think he wanted to be super dad, so he was going to be involved with all our stuff. And and so that just, I, I just, I love sports growing up. I probably like basketball better than all of them. I just, I don't have a basketball body, so... Uh, and I played it all the way up. You know, I loved it, but I just, you know, baseball was a love too. And so um, I was a little bit better at that sport. It sounds like it was pretty early that sports became important to you. Remember how young you were when? Probably as young as you could be, probably four or five, somewhere in there probably, that you're playing games and doing. And since I started playing, I never stopped. I mean, I'm still doing it now, which I, I think is I have a group text with a bunch of my college buddies who are all college coaches. And, you know, last Friday, now, good luck, everybody. Stay healthy. And my response was, man, it's amazing. We still get to be around the game at this age. You know, I'm not that old, but it's 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 what we love to do outside of the, you know, the TV and the salaries and all that type of stuff. Just being able to be with the team still is a, is a great thing. So growing up, playing a lot of sports, being around sports, I, I got to know and I love asking this question. What was Chris Limonis like in high school? Like um, probably a smart aleck. Um, I love, like I said, once again, it was just all about sports, you know. So I had a had a really good group of friends. I, I left. Uh, I went to high school in Houston, and then at my Christmas, my junior year, my dad moved to South Carolina, so I had to switch. So I, you know, kind of a weird transition to be able to move in the middle of high school. But once again, sports. I jumped right in. I was on the baseball team. They actually wanted me to wrestle. Um, and I went the first night. I'd never seen wrestling, and I went and saw everybody in those outfits, and I said, there's no way I'm going to do that. <laughs> I couldn't see myself in that outfit. So, But, you know, jumped right on the baseball team, and that's where my boys were, and then flip over to football and, and played football every day. So it was, uh, it's just always been there for me. Sakisti High School. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you describe your experience there, uh, being there? Because well, it was a Greek American high school, from what I remember, uh, yeah. read about it. Well, yeah, it's a, it was a great it was a great time for me. I mean, if you were going to move somewhere in the middle of high school, how about Myrtle Beach, South Carolina? So you're on the beach. You have every something to do every single day. Um, luckily for me, my high school coach graduated the Citadel and took over our program uh, my senior year. So. Uh, I was able to, it kind of was my pathway to the Citadel. And the Citadel for me was a big step in my career because it's, 
Um, I met, you know, one, all my buddies. We had a great program, but it, it was a place where I could grow and become a player because I wasn't a really good player when I showed up. I had a lot of holes, and so um, it kept me in the game. Because if I'd have stayed in Houston, I was going to Texas, and I don't think I'd have made the Texas team back in the day. <laughs> you talk about going to the Citadel. You majored in, initially, electrical engineering like your dad did here at Mississippi State. Was that why you? That's why, and I, I got an academic scholarship to go and be an electrical engineer, and um, my dad did it, and seemed like that's what I was supposed to do, and then it took about two and a half weeks. I went from EE to PE. And so I, uh, and my dad was upset. I mean, he wasn't happy. I had to turn the scholarship back in. I had to, you know, there was different pieces there. And he, you know, he, he didn't want me just to coach. He, you know, you know, he wanted me to, you know, for your whole career. I mean, they don't pay high school coaches enough. So he's thinking that's what I'm going to do. And um, the funny part is now is, he hadn't missed a game probably in years. I keep telling, I always tell him, if I was an engineer, you'd be bored to death. You wouldn't have anything to do. So it's, um, it's, a, it's been a cool thing. It's worked out for me. Um, I'd have loved it if I coached at the high school level or wherever. I, I just I enjoy the game and I enjoy the relationship with the kids and the coaches and still being on a team, I think, is, is what keeps me going. And you talk about playing first base for the Citadel Bulldogs, 1990 to 1993 under head coaches Chowport and then Fred Jordan, two men you greatly credit your success now as head coach. You guys go to the College World Series in 1990. And given where you are now and what you're doing now, being back here in Starkville and all the success, how would you describe your emotions as a player your first time in Omaha back in 1990? Well, you know, I've told our team this story. Like, so I'm on the team. I'm, you know, 1990 is a great year for Citadel, best year ever. Um, I'm travel all year. I, you know, Part of the mix, started in a game, you know, DH some. Um, I don't make the travel cut my freshman year. And so, you know, I told this, I, this team right here, I told them the other day, I said, no, it's, you know, how tough is that to watch your team? And back then you didn't have the reach. Like now we take everybody, right? I mean, when you, and our ADs know I'm taking everybody because of my situation, right? Um, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm on a team. I'm a part of the team. The next three years, I'm a starter and all-conference player. But, you know, you take an extra pitcher and, you know, a guy's left off and, you know, it was it was crushing. It, I, I told our team that's why I became a player, is because I was pissed, and I was like, no, there's no way I'm not playing next year. And so, I had a little more motivation maybe than the other guy. And so I ended up getting to go. You know, my first time I really go is 07. You know, and uh, really a neat experience for me to be able to go. And all my Citadel teammates show up, and they're hugging me and everything else, knowing I got to finally make it. You know, in person. You know, I was on an Omaha team, and I felt a very big part of it, but. Um, being able to get there and make it and drive up that hill to Rosenblatt was pretty special. So you complete your bachelor's degree in physical education in 92, your playing career in 93, if I have that right. So what, what were your goals and ambitions coming out of the Citadel? I wanted to coach. Yeah. I mean, I, I took a high school job that first year. Uh, I wanted to be around the game, wanted to coach. I, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And that was about it. And I took a high school job as an assistant coach right there in town and, and coached. And luckily, I had the best player in the city that nobody knew about. And I pulled the old rope-a-dope. The Citadel signed him, and I got to go with him the next year. My best friend was the other assistant, Dan McDonald, who coached at Ole Miss here as the head coach at Louisville. And uh, man, I learned a lot in those seven years. It was rough. It was hard. You know, you know the young coaches today, they don't – I worked a couple years for free. I, I taught elementary school during that time. I was the first one. I had to take the stop sign every morning because they let me leave early every afternoon. And um, so it was a, it was what they, the good old grind, they say. But uh, I loved every minute of it. I wouldn't take any of it back. You look back now with that, that time under Coach Fred Jordan that you're talking about, and you said you wouldn't take it back. Again, reflecting, you know, back on that time, how instrumental – when you look at the successes now, how instrumental was that time to coach with Coach Jordan? Yeah, it was uh, it was huge. I mean, we're still close. We still talk all the time. I was I was fortunate. You know, I, I played for Chow Port, who was a Hall of Fame coach. I mean, and he was hard. And but he taught. I mean, there's still things I still use. And then as I become a player, I get to coach. I get to coach and play under Fred Jordan. So I kind of had. I got to see both styles, and both styles were very different, but very influential in my career. And I still call Fred Jordan on. Hey, man, what do you think? You know, I mean, we still talk. We still communicate. Every time I go back to Charleston, I see him. And it's just, a, you know, when you have good people in your life, I mean, he wasn't, you know, a lot of this is about relationships. And I think that was the biggest thing with Coach is I learned a lot. And he probably had to slap us, me and Dan McDonald on the head a couple of times because 
trying to do too much, but the reality was he, he let us coach too. You know, as young coaches, a lot of people, you know, the head coach wants to do everything. And I think that's something I do now with my guys is I let them, I let them coach. I let them coach their positions. I'm not over their head every time. And Coach Jordan did a great job with that with us. You were at the Citadel for a while as an assistant coach, and then in 2006, the opportunity comes. You mentioned Dan McDonald. You get an opportunity to join him at Louisville. So knowing what the Citadel meant to you, this is a yeah. place that was instrumental early in your career. How difficult was it to, to leave? <laughs> I love the Citadel, um, but I was ready. It's hard. I mean, I'd recruit 10 guys and get one, you know, because not everybody wanted to be in a military school. and. I'd, we'd lose a guy and I'd say, hey, well, who else is offering? Nobody, but I'm not going to march. You know, I don't want to march. And so uh, the joke was, you know, Dan McDonald called and offered me the job. And I said, all right, I'm coming. And then I, oh, I got to call my wife and check and make. But, you know, like it was, you know, I was on the road. Actually, I was in Chicago recruiting. He called me. He got the job. It, you just know people. I think that's the biggest thing, you know, people. And I knew I wanted, I knew I was ready for the move. And it's scary. Even every time you move, it's scary. But it also, I knew people. I knew he was going to do a great job. And he, to me, he's as good as there is in the country. And so I learned how to grind, how to work, how to over recruit, like in terms of not over recruiting, like taking too many guys. But we had to work so hard to build a relationship at the Citadel. And then I got to learn how to be in a program that's nationwide, that's an Omaha type program to coach the best players in the country. And so those two dynamics put together for me were huge. And they, I mean, I still, I mean, I was on the phone yesterday with Dan McDonald talking about the game, talking about, hey, what do you think about this? And, and um, you know, he's one of the best. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. When you find a great community, you will find great health care. That is exactly what King's Daughters Medical Center provides. Keeping businesses moving with occupational wellness, heart healthy screenings, diabetes education and management, community education, and remote patient monitoring that promotes better care in between regular office visits. KDMC, caring for our community like no one else can. Wendy's $3 breakfast deal is a bacon or sausage croissant plus seasoned potatoes for just three bucks. It's the kind of breakfast that really sticks with you, especially if you're Tyler. Tyler. Ah. Our breakfast. Oh. If you want a better breakfast you'll never forget, Wendy's is that breakfast. Choose wisely. Choose Wendy's $3 breakfast deal. Family owned and operated since 1986, Lakeside Molding has become the trusted source of architectural products throughout the South. They offer fine interior architectural moldings, custom millwork, and cabinet doors designed and handcrafted in Flowood. Their showroom on Lakeland Drive is stocked with today's most sought-after interior details, including corbels, posts, fireplace mantles, bath vanities, mirrors, and much more. Tim Shoemaker and his staff work closely to meet client needs for new construction, restoration, and remodeling projects. Lakeside Molding, where details make the difference. For those on the go, we give you Audibles with Jason Scarborough, the podcast. What are we listening to? Are we listening to a playlist? Are we listening to a podcast? What a great question. Listen to our intimate interviews with guests on your favorite podcast platforms, including iTunes, Google Play, Amazon Music, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, and so many more. Do you ever look back and say, you know, my life, the story could have ended up differently had it not been for your grandparents? In incredibly uh, different, yeah. for sure. Plus, you'll hear behind-the-scenes commentary on each guest, interview preparation, location, and so much more from Jason himself. Do you have a, uh, a favorite Coach Bowden story uh, that you can share with us? I can tell you this. What you see with Bobby Bowden is what you get. Mm. Check out Audibles with Jason Scarborough, the podcast, on any of these popular podcast locations and hit subscribe, download, and enjoy. Now, back to the show. I don't think people really remember, at least, you know, if you just started following the game, but Louisville, before you and Dan McDonald got there, they weren't this dominant brand of college baseball. But with you guys being there, people love when I do this. You guys helped lead the Cardinals to three College World Series appearances, seven 
NCAA appearances and eight seasons, your eight seasons as a head coach or an assistant coach. You were a part of three 50-win seasons, a huge part of the recruiting efforts there. You guys produced 33 professional players in 2013. You're named American Baseball Coaches Association uh, and Baseball America Assistant Coach of the Year. That's a lot of success for a program that had not had a whole lot before you guys got there. There was, uh, I think it was one regional in 90 something years they had been to. And it was, it was good timing too. So it was brand new stadium opened. Tom Jurich, the athletic director, who was awesome, was, was, was real supportive. They wanted baseball to be good. And then uh, that staff that Dan put together, I, that, I'm the only one to leave in that time frame. I mean, like mm -hmm. Roger Williams is still there. He hired an unbelievable pitching coach. Roger Williams was there. Um, Dan's still there. I mean, the guy that took my spot's still there. So continuity, but it's a, it's a special place. And I, I think one of the things that I think in those eight years, we were the winningest program in college baseball at that time, which we took a lot of pride in. And because um, it was a hard recruitment. We were Big East. We are you know, we'd. We'd be recruiting a kid and they'd show him a picture of somebody where somewhere. You're gonna have to go here and play in the league. And you know, we were recruiting against Kentucky all the time. John Cohen, you know, so um, that's a tough one to recruit against. So um, as we were going head to head, and I think that's kind of helped me as I got here is John knew the job that we did there, you know, and it was head to head. I mean, we went head to head on so many kids and they're selling SEC and we're selling, you know, development and winning. And, and then they were selling that too, I'm sure. But it was a, it was a, it was a hard battle. I got to think the success there, even going back to the success at the Citadel as an assistant and the things you learned from Coach Jordan, now the success that you've had at Louisville, that has to be further bolstering this desire to be a head coach, I would think. Yeah, I, I, I never was dying to be the head coach. I knew it at that point I needed to be one. I'd turn down some opportunities. Um, and I was just looking for the perfect one. And I had kids, you know, when you're a coach and you have kids in certain areas, um, you know, I had one who was a sophomore in high school. So I turned down a couple of jobs and the next year, Indiana comes and it's an hour and a half from Louisville and my daughter could stay in her high school and, and do some things. So, but Indiana was kind of like Mississippi State. It was, you know, they had just gotten back from Omaha. They were top 10 program, you know, and it was, and it, I, I tell people all the time, I could have stayed in Indiana forever. I mean, it is a special place and I love it here, but it's just, I've been blessed that I've been at really cool, different places all across the map, but I've, We've really enjoyed them, I think, and, and that was a that was a good next step for me. He gave me a chance to grow. Our administration there was great. They gave me a chance to grow. So it comes in July 2014. So so take me back to that moment. What it was like for you all? The you mentioned the grinding, yeah. all the, the the times at the Citadel, losing recruits, things like that. All just all the, your track record at this point, and now you finally get your shot as a head coach. Nervous, like I'm always nervous when I take one over. I, I don't know. Most coaches are so tough, they would never say that, but you're nervous. You gotta put together a staff. You gotta, you gotta get that, you know, for coaches in the summer, you have to secure a recruiting class and get everybody in there. And it's even harder now for guys that are taking jobs. So it was, uh, it was hectic, um, like drinking water out of a fire hydrant. You know, you're sitting there trying to take it all in, but there was a lot to do. But once again, I, I went into a good spot, a good stadium, um, good team, good dynamic there. Um, and we just got to work. And I was able to put together a really good staff and, and um, and we had some fun. We had a lot of fun. It's a tough league. I mean, you're dealing with weather and travel and different things. This time of year, I love being here because I, <laughs> I know how hard it is to coach in the Midwest. I mean, it's just, it's not an easy gig. And, um, but it was, it was fun. We really enjoyed it. I've always wanted to ask you this because you have taken over programs and, and been successful. Like, so when you take over a program, you took over Indiana and now here at Mississippi State, what is your planning process like? Are you, are you getting a, a legal pad and, and putting a to-do list together. You go into the grease board, you make in a, a motto, a slogan for the, but what is your planning process like when you take over a program? You know, I, I, it's all about players, right? When you take over, it's just about players. I mean, my first year here, you know, there was, there was a lot of disconnect of a lot of things. You know, it had been three head coaches in four years. It, the ballpark was, I mean, we were a construction site. Um, I didn't have a schedule we were opening up. I didn't have an opponent for opening weekend. I didn't, ha there was a lot of things. We weren't doing a great job academically and everything, things that are important to me. And so I, I, I would, I would always, you know, and we we're having to, you know, figure out recruiting and, you know, all the other staffs had signed and it just, it was, it was tough. But I'd always tell Goat, 
but we got good players. You know, we, we had a good group. We were lucky to get Jake Mangum back. Ethan Small came back. Cole Gordon came back. We were, you know, those are your big recruits at that point of getting, they could have all signed. And, um, and we, we, we really did. We had that, that, that first team, it wasn't, we didn't have great depth. Luckily we stayed healthy, but it was a good team and they were fun to coach because there were some big personalities on that team, some real alpha guys and uh, fun to be able to watch them in this environment. Because for you know when you're coaching here for the first time and you walk out, it's a little intimidating and it's a little you know it's you just for me who I'm I mean when I was a kid I never missed a College World Series game on ESPN like it you're you're watching you know you're you're coming here and you know just the tradition of this place and how special this place is. You know it's funny because you're you just mentioned that a minute ago about you could have stayed in Indiana you were happy there you were having success. How early did Mississippi State kind of start appearing on the radar as, or at least for you, where it went through your mind like, hey, this, this could be a possibility here? It really never went through my mind a lot, probably until Super Regionals, I got a phone call. I tell people all the time I never came and interviewed. It was all, you know, by the by phone, by talk, and I, I just never came to Starkville, the whole process, never saw the field, never anything. My best friend, one of my Citadel teammates the, in Omaha, his son, who's still here, um, it, you know, came, was coming here to go to school and they were on a visit. He, he called me and said, man, that new stadium's like, I couldn't even tell him that, hey, I'm in the mix. You know, I, I didn't even tell my mom and dad because my mom and dad, uh, if I didn't get it, they would have been crushed, right? They were living in Birmingham and they'd lived there for a long time. And if I told them I was getting this job, they would have, they couldn't have handled it. So, um, so it was, a, it was kind of a weird process. The night they lost in Omaha, I get a text about, 11.30 at night, and we'd I'd like to talk early in the morning, and we got up and talked and made it happen. In your introductory press conference, June 25th, 2018, you're named the 18th head baseball coach here at Mississippi State, and you talked about in that press conference how it had been just a whirlwind. Yeah. So take me to that moment. You're back here in Starville, a place that meant so much to you, your dad, and you got emotional several times in that introductory press conference, and rightfully so. Well, I'm always emotional. Our kids, they laugh. I'm Greek, probably the only Greek baseball coach in the country, so I, had, I tell them it's like the old Jim Valvano. I'm probably going to yell at you some during practice. I'll probably cry some, and I'll hug you, and then we'll laugh a little bit because I, I do. I just, I'm emotional. You know, I get emotional if things matter to me, but it, it did. Like, I, you know, my, my class in school, I took Baseball 101, and I had the Ron Polk playbook. Like I had it my whole life. Like I literally, I went to a class and took a Ron Polk playbook and then I get to coach here, which I'd have never in a million years would have thought that. So some of that stuff really, it does, it does matter to you. And it's, this is it. This is, you know, my AD in Indiana, who I loved, you know, he called me and he says, hey, what, what can we do? What can we, how can we sweeten the pot to keep you? And I just said, hey, I said, I'm not, I just don't want to play this game if they offer and I'm going. And I think John will tell you, which I do a poor job of, I should have negotiated harder just on the contract and stuff. Like, you know, it's, uh, I just, I want to be here. And just, you, you take the job and yeah, I took it. I don't think I changed anything in the contract or anything. I just, yeah, I'm coming, you know, and when do we get started? So it's just, it's one of those places I probably should if I ever, you know, had to do that again. I'd, I'd do a better job in the contract process, but like, I just, this is where I wanted to be. And it's the best place in college baseball. I told you before the interview started, the thing I appreciate about you is you are so real and honest. And you said, well, there's probably some, co there, there's no coach speak, yeah. at least when I'm watching. Yeah. And in that press conference, you mentioned, you know, I'm, hey, I'm taking over a team that just got back from Omaha. So I hear coaches talk about buy-in yeah. when they take over a program or every, every season trying to get that buy-in over again. So in some ways you're having to sell right Chris Lamonis to these kids so how did you I guess sell Chris Lamonis it was really hard when I came back they got off the bus from Omaha just got beat uh, unbelievable run and before I go into that you did tip your hat to Gary we're still reaping the benefits of the job Gary Henderson did to keep that team together and get them there I say it all the time every time I see Gary I give him a hug and tell him I mean it just uh, just a really you know unbelievable job 
But they're getting off the bus from Omaha and I'm standing there and I'm having a team meeting and I'm supposed to inspire them. And uh, I didn't inspire them. We had a quick meeting and got out of there. But the reality was it was the one-on-one. -on -one. It was the daily. I listened. You know, I talked to Jake Mangum was here that summer and I talked to him a lot. What does this team need? What do we need to do? Luckily, Jake Gotro stayed. Jake Gotro, probably the best assistant coach in the country in terms of, you know, staying here and being a part and helping us out there. You know, I think that was a a really big piece. And then I was able to hire Scott Fox. All my, both my assistants have won national assistant coach of the year, um, you know, since we've been here. So I think that says a lot, but um, just listening and, and understanding what they wanted and what they needed. And it was some of the things that I think John did a great job because I think he knew my strengths coming in, you know, uh, um, you know, I was a recruiter. So my biggest piece was recruiting. And I think, uh, um, I'm, I'm, you said real, but I, I think our kids kind of know me. Like they realize, you know, who they're getting every day. Sometimes it's good and probably sometimes it's bad, but it's, uh, but I think they know I care about them. I think that's one of the bigger pieces here. And this can get to be really big and um, can be really hard at times if you, you're, you can't get used to it. So um, we don't want it to suffocate, you know, in terms of, you know, if you're not playing well, it can be tough on them. So. Um, being a player's coach and being here, I think, is huge. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. We believe patient-centered care is where it all begins. That's why King's Daughters Medical Center ranks nationally in patient care and safety. Our staff's commitment to better health care means a higher quality of life for so many. We are one team, one heartbeat, one mission to provide this community with the high quality health care. KDMC, caring for our community like no one else can. Wendy's $3 breakfast deal is a bacon or sausage croissant plus seasoned potatoes for just three bucks. It's the kind of breakfast that really sticks with you, especially if you're Tyler. Ah. Our breakfast. Oh. If you want a better breakfast you'll never forget, Wendy's is that breakfast. Choose wisely. Choose Wendy's $3 breakfast deal. We're going the extra mile, and we're taking you with us. We have a responsibility to get the work to the streets. Join us on the Extra Mile podcast as we travel Mississippi highways to bring you in-depth conversations with state leaders. You gotta have the ability to get their product to market. Infrastructure stakeholders and Mississippi locals to give you a behind-the-scenes look at transportation throughout the state. Highways, um, movement of goods, these are things that we rely on every day. You can listen and watch episodes of the show by visiting gomdot.com forward slash the extra mile. For those on the go, we give you Audibles with Jason Scarborough, the podcast. What are we listening to? Are we listening to a playlist? Are we listening to a podcast? What a great question. Listen to our intimate interviews with guests on your favorite podcast platforms, including iTunes, Google Play, Amazon Music, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, and so many more. Do you ever look back and say, you know, my life, the story could have ended up differently had it not been for your grandparents? In incredibly uh, different, yeah. for sure. Plus, you'll hear behind-the-scenes commentary on each guest, interview preparation, location, and so much more from Jason himself. Do you have a, uh, a favorite Coach Bowden story uh, that you can share with us? I can tell you this. What you see with Bobby Bowden is what you get. Mm. Check out Audibles with Jason Scarborough, the podcast, on any of these popular podcast locations and hit subscribe, download, and enjoy. Now, back to the show. You talked about being nervous when you got the job here. And every, uh, job. every job, yeah, but especially here, right? Yeah. Uh, that first season, 2019, well, if you were nervous, it didn't show. You lead the Bulldogs back to the College World Series, 52 and 15. You set a new record for wins for a first-year SEC head coach 
in his first season, only the third SEC head baseball coach to advance to the College World Series in his first season. That it's a pretty good debut there. So the nerves, right? That's no, they're always still there. So it's, it doesn't matter. But it's still, it's a, uh, it was a good team, good coaches. They played well. Um, we had some kids have some career years, which is a lot of fun. Uh, you take a lot of pride in that as a coach because it's not easy. A lot of those kids, luckily for us, our kids had been spurned by the draft. So that, you know, a lot of times when you have these great juniors, they're living under that draft thing, and the Ethan Smalls and the Jake Mangums and Elijah McNamee's, they were kind of pissed, you know, which I had in 21 with Tanner Allen and Rowdy Jordan. They were, they were past the draft, and now we're gonna, I'm going to prove it to you, which is kind of a better mentality to have going into it. But, yeah, it was a, it was a phenomenal year, a lot of fun. I mean, we had just I – mean, we had a blast that year, opening the new ballpark and, and um, just every getting to go and play. I, I wasn't an SEC guy. I would played at South Carolina – I'd played at Kentucky because of the places I was at, but I hadn't played through all these places. So having John Cohen was a really big piece for me then. I think that was something that people, and not like telling me how to coach, just, hey, John, I'm going to Arkansas, which he didn't do a good enough job prepping me on that one, so we got beat there. <laughs> but John just gets it. He knew it, and, you know, having that background for us was huge, and, and uh, being able to help do that first year for me was, it was I, I would call him all, all right, I don't need the athletic director. I need the coach. Tell me. What do you got here? And he was really good at that. It is unique, you know, when you got here that you did have Coach Cohen. So I, I still call him Coach Cohen. He, he hates that because uh, now he's AD Cohen. So I know that, you know, of course he plays for Coach Paul. Yeah. And then he's a coach here. So you've got a, a really unique situation with a guy that not only played here, coached here, and now was athletic director here. So... You kind of have the, well, the best of all work. I, I would look up in scrimmages, and I have him and Coach Polk up there making notes together. I'm wondering what the heck's going on, right? So the nerves start all over again. Uh, yeah, it's like, uh, oh, these guys. Um, and I live right next to Polky, so he, we live about six houses apart, and he wears me out every day. But, <laughs> you know, in, in my, my four years here under John, um, I, that was my biggest fear coming, that I was going to get micromanaged from John. Never. Not one time. We would talk a lot of baseball, and, and you had to because he's brilliant. And then he's in charge of college baseball. But it was – he never – and last year we had a tough year. Not once. Like, did, did I get – you know, and probably should have, you know, the way we were playing at times. But he just – he never crossed that line. And, and that was – you know, that was really nice for me as a coach. You know, and we would talk – I'd go to him. I'd ask him questions. I'm not – I'm not, I don't sit here and think I know it all. So I, having somebody like John on your side, you were constantly talking. But he, he did is probably a good – he surprised me in that world because I thought it would be more, and it was none. Going back to 2020, that season was weird because, you know, the pandemic hits, shuts down all of college sports. Go to 2021, I'm, I'm curious, in the preseason camps, the practices, was there ever anything, I don't know, that caught your attention that said, all right, this, this group could be special? Yeah, it, we, we knew we were good. I mean, we were in the top five all year, um, just like the 19 and then even 20. You know, we, we knew we were good. We, we had that crazy experience because we'd been there, you know, a couple years in a row. Um, everybody was nervous about COVID. You didn't know you were still coming out and there's 25% of your crowd and still in face mask and all that world's hard to think about. But I have a picture in my office. We went to, um, I forgot the name of the tournament. They'll kill me the Arlington tournament, and they did there in the Rangers' place, and we had the ice storm. We had to share a plane with Ole Miss, which I don't know if we'll ever do that again. And there was no issues, but, like, it's just hard getting in a plane and having Ole Miss there, you know. Um, but we were able to do it. We wanted to play. We wanted to play the game. And uh, we go to that tournament, and it's the best 16s maybe in the country. You know, I mean, it was just really good tournament. And we had so many arms that were just dynamic. I mean, it was 15 guys that were 95 or better, a couple first-rounders. Uh, and, and I knew we had a chance to be really good, but we fought through the early season. You know, we had to fight through Tulane weekend. We had to, we had to fight through some tough games, and, um, but we just kept getting better, and we kept growing, and we had, you know, the Tanner and Rowdy duo there that just, they were so competitive. Uh, they made us a, such a competitive group. You know, what's interesting about the end of that season, it had its bumps, yeah. had its share of, of, of challenges, the Missouri series, Shocked everybody, and then the SEC tournament. And I got to say this on camera to my state friend Tyler Gibson. He's like, "What's going on?" And I'm like, "You guys are going to be fine." And I, you know, I was just trying to calm the guy down. Like, you got, hey, this is Mississippi State. You're worried about the NCAA. You're not worried about anything else. And sure enough, 
you guys get in the tournament, NCAA tournament, I mean, just basically look dominant throughout the, the NCAA tournament. You get back to Omaha in 2021, and this is when the magic starts. So what was your message to the team before y'all took the field that first day in Omaha? I'm curious because you always have you this. Know, we, we spoke a lot about focus, just staying focused, play the game, stay focused. We had, we had come through, the, you know, the Missouri, you went to Missouri and my, one of my player development coach, he was getting engaged Sunday night after the Missouri season. And I come in after the game, I do the press conference and he's laying face first on his desk. That was my best coaching job of the entire year is we got him up and got him engaged that night. And our extent, you know, and, and we, and we go to a party and we hang out and we laugh and talk as a group and just, we got it past us a little bit, you know, cause it was, depressing because we could win the SEC and we kind of lost it there. And boy, the fan base is, gets, like you said, Tyler, I'm sure he was very upset. <laughs> then we go to Hoover and lose the two games by 10 run rule. And I throw, and people say, hey coach, you didn't want to win. I said, I threw Bednar, Sims, and McLeod in the same game. If you don't think I wanted to win, and we still gave up 10 runs, right? So that whole piece, that whole dynamic, you know, made it, you know, it was, it was tough. And so we just got back to, hey, let's get us, just let's just have good practices. And we, I gave them a little time off. My guys liked to hunt and fish. They were fishing the whole time. Um, but, man, we came to a tough regional. And then, man, we came to the toughest super. I mean, the best baseball we played all year was in that super against Notre Dame. I mean, that was, I mean, that was a dogfight every game. And so, um, yeah, we got to Omaha. We were confident. And we were fresh. You know, I, I tell people, uh, Will Bednar, luckily we moved him up so we get to start him in the first game. And, you know, he missed the first four weeks of the season. Sometimes that's a blessing at the end. I, I look up at Ole Miss last year in Delusia. You know, he didn't get all those starts. He didn't have the crazy, you know, my first year, Ethan Small. Shoot, we, he had, had to gut it out every Friday night. You know, you don't have that fresh guy when you're there. And Bednar was fresh and he was loving it. So um, he kind of put us on his back out there. Yeah, that first game, if I remember the schedule right, you start off with Texas mm -hmm. and you, you, you beat Texas. And then you have this crazy up and down game with Virginia. It wasn't up and down. It was, the guy had a no hitter into the seventh and we were getting crushed, you know, and we just, you know, but that team wouldn't quit. You know? So take me in the dugout that day. So what do you think? Of, I mean, you're like, man, we can't even get a hit. And I think there was like a no hit till the seventh inning or something people, like that. People don't realize, like we knew that was going to be a really hard game. That Griffin McGarry was the pitcher for Virginia, and he had had awful stats, but the last three weekends he had been phenomenal, and we had heard it from everybody. And he's one of the best pitchers in the minor. He's about to be a big leaguer, I mean, in this short amount of time. But he just figured it out. And uh, I think Tanner Allen's the one who came back in the first, and he turned to Coach Goat, and he says, we're going to have to earn this today. And it was it was just filthy stuff, you know. And it's not easy to hit there at certain games, you know. Luckily, we were able to get something going there. Kellum got a big hit just to get us on, you know, get us going. And then um, Tanner, you know, gets the home run there. And uh, luckily, we can get Landon Sims up and ready and get him ready to roll. But, you know, Tanner had played summer ball with the, the kid, you know, that the, the pitcher from Virginia. They were good buddies and a great kid. And, and uh, he was sitting slider, so, and he got it, so. You guys hit a little bump in the road there against Texas again, but you're still able to advance to the College World Series finals against a familiar foe in Vanderbilt and, and drop the first game. And you gotta be thinking at that point, man, are you kidding me? We, we get to the finals and this first game right off, right off the bat. So what'd you tell the team after that first game against Vanderbilt? Well, you know, we, we were awful in the first inning and then we felt like we won the rest of the game. And um, the message was, is man, you, we can pitch them, we can play against them, we can, like in, in the history of the World Series over the last 10 years, the team that wins game two, you either go one and two, or, but if the team that wins game two, you are not winning game three. And it happens over and over and over because of the momentum. That one team's going to the ballpark thinking we're about to win it all. And then we thumped them in that next game. So the message was, you know, hey, like I said, and we knew we had, you know, we had to gut it out with our pitching staff that night. Now, those two, Houston Harding and Preston Johnson, the job they did there was phenomenal. But, um, you know, it just, it was, it's just, we, we felt like we could play. And we played them really good in Nashville earlier in the year. It was, I just, you know, I, every time I've gone to Omaha, I've gotten beat by like Pandy. And, or every time they've won it, I've had to play, you know, my first year in Indiana, we're in the finals there against Corbin and they beat us, you know. And then my first year here, Rocker beats us in the, 
and the undefeated game. And then even when I was at Louisville the first year they won it, they beat us. And so I'm sitting there thinking like, God, oh, I cannot lose these guys again. And so uh, luckily that team, you know, that, that group of guys wasn't going to let it happen. Don't go anywhere. Audible's returns in a moment here on the Spirit Media Network. Quality of life is about lifelong care. Your family's health care is important to you, and that's important to us. King's Daughters Medical Center is here for your family in every stage of life, from the excited new parents, adolescent and teen years, to the big day. Walking alongside of you in life's journey, living a healthier life. KDMC, caring for our community like no one else can. Family owned and operated since 1986, Lakeside Molding has become the trusted source of architectural products throughout the South. They offer fine interior architectural moldings, custom millwork, and cabinet doors designed and handcrafted in Flowood. Their showroom on Lakeland Drive is stocked with today's most sought after interior details, including corbels, posts, fireplace mantles, bath vanities, mirrors, and much more. Tim Shoemaker and his staff work closely to meet client needs for new construction, restoration, and remodeling projects. Lakeside Molding, where details make the difference. Wendy's $3 breakfast deal is a bacon or sausage croissant plus seasoned potatoes for just three bucks. It's the kind of breakfast that really sticks with you, especially if you're Tyler. Tyler. Ah. Our breakfast. Oh. If you want a better breakfast you'll never forget, Wendy's is that breakfast. Choose wisely. Choose Wendy's $3 breakfast deal. For those on the go, we give you Audibles with Jason Scarborough, the podcast. What are we listening to? Are we listening to a playlist? Are we listening to a podcast? What a great question. Listen to our intimate interviews with guests on your favorite podcast platforms, including iTunes, Google Play, Amazon Music, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, and so many more. Do you ever look back and say, you know, my life, the story could have ended up differently had it not been for your grandparents? In incredibly uh, different, yeah. for sure. Plus, you'll hear behind-the-scenes commentary on each guest, interview preparation, location, and so much more from Jason himself. Do you have a, uh, a favorite Coach Bowden story uh, that you can share with us? I can tell you this. What you see with Bobby Bowden is what you get. Mm. Check out Audibles with Jason Scarborough, the podcast, on any of these popular podcast locations and hit subscribe, download, and enjoy. Now, back to the show. Yeah, yeah. it feels like there was some frustration taken out in that game, too. You said thumped them. It was like 13-2 in that game too. So you gotta be feeling confident, gotta be feeling good. You roll into game three, college world series. This is what you dream of. Chance for national championship, winner take all as a player, a coach. So what what's your message to the staff and the team before y'all roll out on the field that night? Um, it was, you know, we, we talked about writing our, fi writing our final chapter. You know, I think that was one of the things that we talked about and um, we knew, I mean, Vanderbilt, I mean, they've been the example for the last so long. I mean, I've known Tim Corbin since I was 20 years old, and I mean, that guy's as good as it gets, you know? And so we are we know we're up for a big challenge and we're facing Kumar Rocker. I kept telling him all year, like, you know, it, when, when we win it, it's gonna be the hardest path that you have to take. It's gonna be the hardest road. It's not gonna be easy for Mississippi State. And, you know, you're looking up and you're placing the probably the best pitcher in college baseball history, and you have to beat him to win it. And uh, our kids were up for it, man. They just, they were, uh, it was almost too loose. We were nervous before the game because, you know, you come out the tunnel and you got Vanderbilt and they look like the mill and, huh, and they're doing jumping. And, and, and my guys, like, they're not even dressed the same. They're laughing. They're joking. It's Tanner's cut his sleeves off. Like, <laughs> they're playing home run derby in the in the cage. But they were just as loose as could be. And, and um, 
you know, I, there was just, hey, they were almost on borrowed time, I think they felt like, and they were supposed to be there. So it was a, uh, it was a fun group. They just, you know, they coached that team. They were in charge of that team. I mean, that group of guys is, that was a lot of fun. It's a blowout win over Vanderbilt that night. So I'm curious when that final out is recorded. I mean, you, I've heard you in other interviews talk about not the pressure, but maybe it was the pressure building for this fan base. They've wanted it. They've been so close so long. And you're talking about all of these great players that have come yeah. through here, all of these coaches that have come through here. Yeah. So when you finally hear the words Mississippi State, baseball national champions, I mean, what what, what goes through your mind now? Yeah, it's awesome. It was, a, uh, it was such a celebration for our fans. You know, I really, I mean, I, I just, it felt like a relief, right? I mean, it felt like a big relief. I'm actually on the... Cheese, Coach Cheese had lost his dad that, that year. I lost my mom that year. So I'm literally turning to Cheese and I said, hey, I hope they're watching, you know. And boom, you get the punt. And we're like, how the, how the hell is he bunting right here? <laughs> I was glad he bunted, but you know, like, and, and it was over and I'm looking at Cheese and we hug and it was, you know, but it's just, we just sat back and watched the players. I mean, that's the, that's the funnest part of it is watching these guys, you know, celebrate and, and our fan base celebrate and our family celebrate. And it was, Really, just such a, a really cool experience, and 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 you know having, you know all the. I mean, we had so many alumni there, and we had Polky there. You know, I mean, it's and Polky's always wearing me out. Like it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And we wear him out too. But you know, I run into him that day in the hotel, and he's always giving me one of these. And you know, he stops and says, "Hey, man, good luck. This is big tonight." And he, you know, for him that was a, you know, because he's a big part of that. You know, when you look, I mean, we don't. This isn't here without him. You know, and so, and really and truly, he probably just won two of them because the whole state of Mississippi is not here because of Ron Polk and, and what he's done for baseball in this state. I mean, I mean, last year, look at, I mean, Southern Miss. I mean, holy cow, they're as close to being there. We had our Pearl River won the national championship in JUCO. We had Madison Central win the national championship in baseball, in high school baseball. Like, this whole state is a product of what he spent doing his whole life. And so uh, we're all reaping the benefits of that. But it's, uh, it was nice to have him there and be a part. And, um, you know, it's just, it was cool for everybody. I call him the godfather of baseball. That's pretty much what I call him, too. The godfather. It kind of goes, too, because he's got the cigar and everything uh, continuously. So it kind of fits. You talked about 2021. You talked about uh, losing your mom. And you talked about one of your assistant coaches losing one of his parents. And so it's this bittersweet moment for you. Yeah. You've got this loss that you've dealt with in your personal life, and you're at the pinnacle of your professional career at this point, reaching the mountaintop. So yeah. how do you marry the two there? It was hard. It was the hardest year of my life, and we won a national championship. How about that? It's, so what happens is I lose my mom. But my dad has Alzheimer's. So now, and he's, he can't go into a home because he has a medical issue. So he's with me for six, six months, probably, of the season and living in our house. That was hard, my poor wife. And uh, everybody else, we had nurses coming daily. And then we get to Omaha. I think it was after the Texas game. They had to take him to the hospital. He's really sick. Like, and I'm on a day-to-day. -day. They had the school has to fly my sister in. Um, and he gets out the night we win it. So he gets to watch it with my sister at uh, the, the nursing home. And uh, then he, we, everybody in the country seen the video where he shows up and he looks perfectly normal. I said, Dad, they kept telling me you were sick. You know, like, I feel good. He didn't remember, you know, obviously. So uh, not to, you know, but he's, uh, he's such a big part of my life. And so was my mom. My mom was awesome, too. So it was so much fun to have them. You know, I took them both to Omaha in 19, which was really a big deal that they got to see that. But um, they, it just, it was tough. I mean, it's amazing how God puts us in these certain places and you have, I mean, I'd, I'd be the last one to Auburn on the weekend because I'd be staying and check my dad in the hospital for something and we'd sweep them. And I'm like, you know, golly, you would think I need to, you know, it, it puts some perspective on things of, um, but I just had to take care of family first. I read that you got to hand the championship trophy to your dad when you guys got off the plane. Is that is that true? Yeah, we did. I didn't know he was going to be there, so it was a big surprise for me. So I get there, and he I, I wouldn't have, I had to hold it, too, because I was scared he'd drop it. But, yeah, he got to see it and, and was emotional. But he got to go in the parade the next day and, and ride in the fire truck and, and hold the trophy, and it was really a cool day for him. And as a grad, a really cool day, and, you know, it's, you know, He's pretty popular over at his nursing home because everybody knows he's coach's dad. So um, it was a cool experience for him. And it was really neat to be able to bring that back and, you know, show it to your pops, you know. 
You mentioned last year being kind of a, a, a tough year. We were talking about the, the season this year. You guys uh, have a lot of guys back, have a lot of guys from the portal. We have a lot of new dudes, yeah. A lot of new dudes, yeah. And they come in different ways. Like I said, now you have the high school. We had one of the top high school classes in the country. We had one of the top portal classes in the country. We have a really good JUCO group, you know, and um, it's my job to help put them together. One, we got to teach them the game of baseball, but more importantly, we got to teach them how to play together, I think is, is one of the bigger things. And so we, uh, we had a tough year last year. We had a lot of injuries to some really good players, but we also didn't play together like, like we do. And so uh, I learned some lessons during Lent next year. And, you know, the good part about this group, there's so many new ones, you know, they don't have a lot of thought of last year because they weren't here. So we're starting from fresh and, and this 23 seasons, just a new season for us. You mentioned in your introductory press conference, you mentioned faith, family, baseball. Yeah. And that, not necessarily in that order, but you mentioned those three things are of the utmost importance. Right. Take me through that. You know, I, I grew up in a strong Catholic family. So that was a, my mom, I'd go home for Thanksgiving and our priest would be there and everything else. They'd be, you know, mom would feed everybody. And so, um, I've kind of, you know, I've kind of switched churches, which didn't make her happy, but we, you know, <laughs> our, our faith is faith and, and, and I'm not, not perfect. Our kids will tell you that. I'll tell them all the time. Hey, I, you know, I'll never push it on you, but it's important to me. And then our family, like our just, and I say family, it's, it's your boys, it's your family. It's, it's an important piece of your life. And I, I, I you can't go through life so hard. You know, baseball's hard. Life's hard. It's hard for everybody. Can't tell you times I pick up the phone and I'm on the phone. One of my teammates or buddies or you know so this whole experience for these guys it's it's everlasting man it lasts a lifetime and I think that's a important part and so as you know Mississippi State you know that's you know I made a mistake my first year I said our something about fans or friends and they were like no it's family and I, I get it now like I totally get it because um, it is it's it's a um, we're not the biggest school we're you know there's there's probably bigger cities so we hear that all the time in recruiting even though I think our kids love Starkville, you know, uh, and, and probably bigger schools, but it's a really cool, special place. And if you're a baseball player, it's even better. So I'm going to switch it up on you real quick <laughs> before we get out of here. What is Chris Lamonis like at home? I mean, what what do you do to, to unwind and just kind of kind of kind of chill out? I think of my daughters when you say that, because they could <laughs> fill up another hour of uh I'm kind of like the drill sergeant. Usually with, I got two girls and my wife, so they're always like, dad, you know, but, uh, I've gotten in, I love golf. So if I get some time away, I like to play golf. Um, you know what happened is COVID hit and there is nothing else to do in Starkville, Mississippi, probably during COVID than go play golf. And it's kind of made me competitive and get out. I don't play during the season. Every time I've swung a club in the spring, you know, we get beat. And so um, I, I, I put them up, but during the summers and falls, if I can get away, I'll go out or go out. It's nice, I can take my dad out. He's at the Claiborne, so I have my own golf cart. I can ride over, grab him, we'll play four or five holes, turn the music on, and if it's in the afternoon, I can get him a beer. He's, you know, he'll enjoy <laughs> beer riding around the course, and um, we can, that's the, our best way of hanging out, so probably that's the best for me, but we work so much. I like to travel and see friends and stuff, but um, pretty, pretty laid back. So my final question for you, you're born on the coast, you're here in Starkville for a little while to an MS, MSU engineering grad. You've coached their storied program to this national championship, their first ever national championship. And we know how much pride goes into this baseball program. So but I'm curious, what pages do you still want to write in, in your story here at Mississippi State? Well, I don't think the pages are about me. I think it's about the players. I want them to have that experience. Um, we talked the other day about going to Omaha and how cool it is when they let you walk through that gate. And there's no, really, there's nobody, even Luke, well, I guess Luke Hancock's my only one because he's 37. But like, you know, most of the guys in the program, they haven't experienced that. So you're one to open that door and, and take the next group, you know, and our goal is to win another one and be there. And, but it's right now, I'm just hoping we don't get hurt at practice. You know, like that's the, you know, so as, as we build these teams and go through seasons, you know, of trying to get that next group there. But for every, these are life-changing experiences when you go through a year here and you go to Omaha or win a national championship, that never gets taken away. And um, we'll see it this spring. I mean, we'll have all these different teams come back and celebrate it of what they did 25 years ago, which is so cool, you know, and, and our fans, they remember every bit of it. This is an interview, I, I was joking with you before we started, I've been trying to, 
sit down with you for a couple of years now, and I'm, I'm glad we finally got to do it. Thank you for doing this. I know this is a busy time of year for you, and I hope we get to do part two down the road. You got it. I appreciate you. Hell State. You gonna clap? Yeah. I'm sorry. It's okay. No, you sit where you're comfortable. I haven't moved, have I? No, man, you're doing good. I'm good. I can behave. All right. So, all right, coach. Coach isn't shifting in his seat like I am. I'm over here spinning around. I probably will by the end. Three, two, one. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week for another episode of Audibles with Jason Scarborough.